Marilyn Alexander here, representing Bryan County Federation of Democratic Women, where I serve as treasurer. I want to tell you about Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected to Congress before the passage of the 19th Amendment. Coming from Montana to Oklahoma, I have supreme respect for Jeanette Rankin. She was born in 1880 and died in 1973. She was a suffragist of Montana who was the first woman to be elected to Congress. She was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives as a Republican from Montana in 1916 and again in 1940. Each of Rankin's congressional terms coincided with initiation of U.S. military intervention in the two world wars. A lifelong pacifist, she was one of 50 House members who opposed the declaration of war on Germany in 1917. And in 1941, she was the only member of Congress to vote against the declaration of war on Japan following the attack of Pearl Harbor. A suffragist during the progressive era, Rankin organized and lobbied for legislation for women's suffrage in several states, including Montana, New York, and North Dakota. While in Congress, she introduced the legislation that eventually became the 19th Constitutional Amendment granting unrestricted voting rights to women nationwide. She championed a multitude of diverse women's rights and civil rights causes throughout a career spanning more than six decades. To date, Rankin remains the only woman ever elected to Congress from Montana. She was the eldest of six children, including five sisters and a brother who became Montana's Attorney General and later a Montana Supreme Court Justice. One of her sisters became the first Montana-born woman to pass the Montana Bar Exam, and she lobbied for access to birth control. These were a different brand of Republicans. At the age of 27, Rankin moved to San Francisco to take a job in social work, a new and still developing field. Confident that she had found her calling, she enrolled in the New York School of Philanthropy, now Columbia University, which offered a degree in social work. Later, Rankin moved to Seattle to attend the University of Washington and become involved in the women's suffrage movement. In November 1910, Washington became the fifth state to award voting rights to women. Returning to New York, Rankin became one of the organizers of the New York Woman Suffrage Party, which joined with other suffrage organizations to promote a similar suffrage bill in the New York legislature. During this period, Rankin also traveled to Washington to lobby Congress on behalf of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, NAWSA. Rankin returned to Montana and rose through the ranks of suffrage organizations, becoming the president of the Montana Women's Suffrage Association and the National Field Secretary of NAWSA. <clears throat> In February 1911, she was the first woman to speak before the Montana legislature, arguing in support of voting rights for women. In November 1914, Montana became the seventh state to grant women unrestricted voting rights. Rankin coordinated the efforts of a variety of grassroots organizations to promote her suffrage campaigns in New York and Montana and later North Dakota as well. Later, she would draw from the same grassroots infrastructure for her 1916 congressional campaign. <clears throat> 
Rankin later compared her work in the women's suffrage movement to promoting the pacifist foreign policy that defined her congressional career. She believed with many suffragists of the period that the corruption and dysfunction of the United States government resulted from the lack of women's participation. She said in a disarmament conference in the interwar period, the peace problem is a woman's problem. Rankin's campaign for one of Montana's two at-large House seats in the congressional election of 1916 was financed and managed by her brother, an influential member of the Montana Republican Party. To reach the state's widely scattered population, she traveled long distances. Note the distance from one corner of Montana to the other corner is greater than the distance from Chicago to Washington, D.C. Rankin rallied support at train stations, street corners, potluck suppers on ranches, and remote one-room schoolhouses. She ran as a progressive, emphasizing her support of suffrage, social welfare, and prohibition. During her victory speech, she said, I am deeply conscious of the responsibility resting upon me as the only woman in the nation with voting power in Congress. Her election generated considerable nationwide interest, including reportedly several marriage proposals. Shortly after her term began, Congress was called into an extraordinary April session in response to Germany's declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare on all Atlantic shipping. On April 2nd, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson addressed a joint session and asked Congress to make the world safe for democracy by declaring war on Germany. After intense debate, the war resolution came to a vote in the House at 3 a.m. on April 6th. Rankin cast one of 50 votes in opposition. I wish to stand for my country, she said, but I cannot vote for war. Years later, she would add, I felt the first time a woman had a chance to say no to war, she should say it. Although 49 representatives and six senators also voted against the declaration, Rankin was singled out for criticism. Some considered her vote to be a discredit to the suffrage movement and her authority in Congress, but others applauded it, including Alice Paul of the National Woman's Party and Representative Fiorello LaGuardia of New York. Rankin used her office to push for better working conditions for laborers. Rankin listens to the grievances of federal workers, which included long hours and excessively demanding work pace. She also hired an investigative reporter as a result of her efforts to draw attention to the working conditions, the treasury secretary convened his own investigation and ultimately limited the workday to eight hours. By 1917, women had been granted some form of voting rights in about 40 states. Rankin was instrumental in the creation of the Committee on Women's Suffrage and became one of its founding members. In January 1918, the committee de delivered its report to Congress and Rankin opened congressional debate on a constitutional amendment granting universal suffrage to women. The resolution passed in the House, but was defeated by the Senate. The following year, after Rankin's congressional term had ended, the same resolution passed both chambers after ratification by three-fourths of the states 
it became the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. After leaving Congress, Rankin worked for various pacifist organizations. She argued for the passage of a constitutional amendment banning child labor and supported the Shepherd Towner Act, the first federal social welfare program created explicitly for women and children. The legislation was enacted in 1921 but repealed eight years later. Though many of its key provisions were incorporated in the Social Security Act of 1935. Rankin began her second campaign for Congress in 1939 with a tour of high schools in Montana. She arranged to speak in 52 of the first congressional district's 56 high schools to reestablish her ties to the region. Note that at that time, Montana typically had only one high school per county, with students being bused in and receiving room and board with local residents during the school week. These counties ranged in size up to the size of the state of Rhode Island. In the 1940 race, Rankin, now 60 years old, defeated the incumbent in the primary, an outspoken anti-Semite. While members of Congress and their constituents had been debating the question of U.S. intervention in World War II for months, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, galvanized the country and silenced virtually all opposition. <clears throat> On December 8th, Rankin was the only member of either House of Congress to vote against the declaration of war on Japan. Hisses could be heard in the gallery as she cast her vote. Several colleagues, including Representative and later Senator Everett Dirksen, ask her to change it to make the resolution unanimous, or at least to abstain, but she refused. A woman, as a woman, I can't go to war, she said, and I refuse to send anyone else. Probably a hundred men in Congress would have liked to do what she did, but not one of them had the courage to do it. The Gazette reported that it entirely disagreed with the wisdom of her position, but Lord, it was a brave thing, and its bravery some way discounted its folly. When in a hundred years from now, courage, sheer courage based upon moral indignation is celebrated in this country, the name of Jeanette Rankin, who stood firm in folly for her faith, will be written in monumental bronze, not for what she did, but for the way she did it. Three days later, a similar war declaration against Germany and Italy came to a vote. Rankin abstained. Asked later if she ever regretted her action, Rankin replied, never. If you're against war, you're against war, regardless of what happens. It's a wrong method of trying to settle a dispute. In the 1960s and 70s, a new generation of pacifists, feminists, and civil rights advocates found inspiration in Rankin and embraced her efforts in ways that her own generation had not. She mobilized in response to the Vietnam War. In January 1968, the Jeanette Rankin Brigade, a coalition of women's peace groups, organized an anti-war march in Washington, D.C., the largest march by women since the Women's Suffrage Parade of 1913. Rankin led 5,000 participants from Union Station to the steps of the Capitol building, where they presented a peace petition 
to House Speaker John McCormick. Simultaneously, a group of activists from the Women's Liberation Movement created a protest within the brigade's protest by staging a burial of true womanhood at Arlington National Cemetery to draw attention to the passive role allotted to women as wives and mothers. In 1972, Rankin, by then in her 90s, considered mounting a third house campaign to gain a wider audience for her opposition to the Vietnam War but health forced her to abandon that final project. Although her legacy rests almost entirely on her pacifism, Rankin told the Montana Constitutional Convention in 1972 that she would have preferred otherwise. If I am remembered for no other act, she said, I want to be remembered as the only woman who ever voted in Congress to give women the right to vote. The Jeanette Rankin Women's Scholarship Fund has distributed three million in scholarships. Awards are for $2,000 to women aged 35 and older, generally with three people per household with a median income of $19,000 $920 per year. Many are single mothers. 75% are single heads of household. 48% are the first in their family to ever go to college. 64% have graduated from college compared to the national average of 31% from this demographic and compared with 8% of women graduating with children. Her legacy lives on.